Um, and also, as I'm beginning, uh, we can be casual here. So if any of you have any questions you'd like to ask before I begin the message, anytime, feel free to raise your hand or shout out the question. Uh, anything about India, the Philippines, Singapore in general, or specifically things about our ministry, feel free to ask. Um, so we, we uh, lived in Singapore a number of years ago, and that's actually where I came to began to come to an understanding of rightly dividing the word of truth when I was in Singapore. And uh, as I was learning things, I was teaching what I was learning. And so there's a, so there's a grace church in Singapore. Uh, Singapore is a tough country spiritually, so there's not a lot of growth in numbers, but there's a good, solid core group that has been there for many years and, and is still there. And, uh, and they, they're reaching out, but as I said, it's a, it's a tough country spiritually. Um, and then it, we uh, later lived in the Philippines. And the Philippines, uh, I, I think without doubt, if uh, on, on a percentage basis, there are more churches and more believers in the Philippines who rightly divide the word of truth than anywhere in the world, America or anywhere. In fact, there's one, uh, there's one area in the Philippines, one fairly large area on one of the islands, where uh, I'm not sure if this is still true, but when we were living in the Philippines, in that fairly large area, the, uh, there were more grace churches than any other denomination, including even Roman Catholic. So there are, there are a lot of churches over there that rightly divide the word of truth, and, uh, and very actively reaching out. They, they're, uh, I, I have, I'm working with many Filipinos who have radio ministries and they're writing literature and distributing the literature and they have Bible camps and Bible conferences going on all through the year and in different areas in the Philippines. So a lot of good things going on in the Philippines. So if you ever, uh, if you ever hear something about the Philippines, or it comes to mind, you can rejoice in uh, really a, a great work that's going on there. So they, they don't really need me or you in the Philippines anymore because there are lots of good preachers and a lot of, a lot of saints in the Philippines, but they still enjoy having me come over and encouraging them and teaching them and, and helping them along. Um, so again, you can just rejoice in that. It was also interesting uh, in this trip to to talk with people and find out, and, and they were eager to talk to me, uh, about politics in America since we had an election not so long ago. And, uh, and as I expected, and I, I know from having lived over there and traveled there many times, they hear everything they hear about America is from a certain perspective. And so when they ask me what's going on in America and so forth, they're, they're often quite shocked because it's not what they've been hearing. But then it's also interesting for me to find out what's going on in their countries. And you may or may not have heard there was uh, an election not too long, I think it's maybe about a year ago or so if I remember, in the Philippines, and they elected a, a very controversial figure. Uh, Duterte is his name. They, they often call him the Donald Trump of, of the Philippines. And I, I'm not sure that I would quite call him that, but, um, but he, he has made a number of statements which I will not, make this mo will not repeat this morning because it would be highly inappropriate. Uh, he has very colorful language and has some in, insulted some people, including our former president, in some very strong words. And so uh, and he, he's been accused. He, he's uh, declared a war on drugs in the Philippines. And he has, uh, he's been accused of killing thousands of drug dealers, uh, including even some accusations that he personally has killed some of them. But it, I just want to bring that up just briefly because if you listen to the media here in America, he, you would think that he's the most evil person who's ever been elected in any country. 
But when you talk to Filipinos, he's very popular there. Uh, I have no doubt if an election were held again today that he would easily win again. And so, you know, when you hear stuff about other countries, just keep in mind that it's not necessarily from the perspective of what people in those nations actually are thinking and their viewpoints. Um, but anyway, there, there's a, a very encouraging work going on in the Philippines. And then uh, also we have a work in India. Um, and I, I have traveled most, you know, all through the, the, the nation, it's a huge nation, from north to south, east to west, uh, holding meetings uh, for, for a number of years now. And I, in the initial meetings, I, I preach the gospel because most of them, really, I, I have never met any of them uh, prior to our meetings who have heard a clear gospel. If, they, if they've heard a gospel, it's always some kind of works-oriented gospel. So we, we preach a gospel clearly and then teach them the, the just basic rightly dividing the word of truth. And the response all through India has just been remarkable. Uh, we're, we're just amazed every time we go over there how, how, uh, what a good response we're getting. The, the number of people who come and how eager they are to learn. And so we are, um, we're getting more now into a stage where we're able to train, start really training leaders and uh, we're working with them with some more advanced things, getting beyond, beyond the basic things. Uh, so this time we, we had a meeting, for example. Uh, we invited 70 people, um, all of who, whom had attended a couple of our earlier meetings. And, and just had some, again, some more advanced teaching and, and training of how to go about the work of the ministry. And uh, again, just very, very positive response and very eager. And uh, they're, they're all gathering together, talking about how, you know, what, what can we do going forward to keep learning and growing and planting more churches and and establishing this doctrine in the churches and so forth. So uh, just uh, highly, highly encouraging to see what's going on there. Um, Brian and I were talking. In, in the United States, we're, we're obviously very privileged in material things. But spiritually, this is not an easy country to, to live in and to do the work of the ministry in. Uh, it's, a, it's a very tough country. And sometimes in this country, you can feel like you're just banging your head against the wall and just, you know, people don't want to listen. And if you can get somebody to listen, they won't believe. And, but it's not like that everywhere in the world. There are places like the Philippines and India where people are eager to learn. And uh, even, you know, Philippines is, is around 80% or so Roman Catholic. But many are getting saved, and there's also a, a good number of Muslims in Philippines. Many are getting saved and coming to a knowledge of the truth. And the same thing in India, it's uh, predominantly Hindu, but it's, it's also one of the largest Muslim nations in the world. But again, many are getting saved and coming to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, and, and just, as I say, very eager to learn this doctrine, very quick to believe. In, in many of my meetings, I'll have, I'll have people, as I'm preaching, they'll sometimes stand up and start yelling at me, um, sometimes even walk right up to the front and get on my face and yell at me and so forth. And I, I just calmly you know, let them get their rant out. And then I say, well, look at this verse and look at this verse and so forth. And, and they're, they're willing to do that. And so by the time the meeting is done, uh, many of them will come and apologize for getting a little out of control. And so I, I'm just amazed at the humility they have to, to say you know, publicly, to say what I, I was wrong, what I've been teaching for all these years is wrong, and, uh, and to accept what the Word of God says. So uh, just... Uh, a real privilege to, to be able to be involved in that. Um, and then the, the other thing in India, 
In December of 2004, uh, there was a, a terrible tsunami in India, and uh, hundreds of thousands were killed. So I had just been in that area about two weeks or ten days before that, and had preached a number of times in that area. So we, we wanted to do something to, as a response to that devastation. So we started an orphanage for children whose parents had both been killed in, in the tsunami. And uh, so that was in December, two th or, I mean, in, in uh, 2005, we started that. And so that's still ongoing. And a number of the children are, who are there are still children who were, suffered through that tsunami, because uh, most of the children we took in were very young at that time. Um, but as, as some of them are graduating now from high school and going out and getting jobs, we're replacing them because there's any just overwhelming number of children in India who are just going to spend their life in the street eating garbage and, you know, and many times being abused and so forth. Um, so there, it's not difficult to find you know, children to bring into the orphanage to try to kind of keep the number where, where we started. But that has also been a, a real privilege and blessing to be involved in that and uh, to see, see these children who, when they first came to the orphanage, obviously they're in, in emotional trauma from what has happened and physically they look sickly and weak and and now when I go there, they're, they're exuberant and happy and healthy. And, and uh, we were very careful legally how we set up the orphanage. So we, we are absolutely free to teach the word of God in the orphanage. We, we don't take any government funds and, and so forth. So we have complete freedom to do that, and, and we do so. Um, and so... That, that ministry also is, is going very well, been uh, greatly encouraging. And, and you, some of you may remember a little over a year ago, we, we've been renting a building uh, since 2005 for the, for the orphanage. And a little over a year ago, the owner died and uh, the land and building was passed on to the children and they want to sell it and use it for a different purpose. So first they told us that they wanted us out in two months. So that was a little bit of a panic to figure out how are we going to find another place and get all these children out of here in two months. But then they were a little more reasonable and made it two years. Um, and so, so we raised funds and some of you gave to, to that project. And uh, so the building is coming along well now. It's the, the foundation is done. The walls are going up. The roofing will be going up soon. Uh, and, and so we hope to have it completed in, in plenty of time before we were told we have to move out. And the, the new building is just down the, the road a bit, the, down the street a bit from where we are now. So that it won't be a big adjustment for the children. They won't, they'll be in the same neighborhood. They'll be, be able to go to school the same way they do now and, and so forth. And uh, the children are real excited. They're asking every every week or every day when they can move into the new building. So that's coming along very well. And so again, we appreciate very much your, your prayers and encouragement and financial support. If you're not on our mailing list and would like to be, we have a, a table back there where you can give us your name and address. And, and when I'm traveling overseas, I send, I try to send emails every day to Jean about what what I did and what took place that day, and then she sends them out uh, to our to a list. So if you'd like to be on that list, then leave us your email address, and we can put you on that list. Uh, and I only send out emails when I'm traveling, so you're not going to have your inbox bombarded with all kinds of emails every day. Uh, do you have any questions about any of those nations or the ministry in in any of those countries? Um, I, I go twice a year to Asia, um, definitely to India, uh, sometimes only once to Singapore and the Philippines. And, and when I go, the, the fir years ago, the first time I went, they, they scheduled some, some 
couple of days to to play tourists to go see some tourist things and so forth and and also some rest time because they thought well you must be tr tired from traveling and so we thought we'd just you know give you a half a day or something to rest and I said no don't ever do that again just <laughs> so when when I when my feet hit the ground when the plane lands we immediately you know, I, depending on what time of day it is but if it's uh, like this time I arrived in India late at night, 1 a.m. So we went to sleep, got up, I think, 5 or 6 a.m. and headed for the first meeting and started the first meeting. And, uh, you know, we just keep, we try to avoid any downtime at all. So it's, you know, I, I can be gone two, three weeks, but really accomplish a lot and, and have a lot of meetings and get a lot done. Okay, any other questions? Um, in the Philippines, they, uh, they've had a Muslim problem for a long, long time. Many years before most Americans you know, knew that there was any such things going on in the world. Um, and, that, and that's still a pro big problem there. They have a lot of uh, a lot of money and a lot of connections with Al Qaeda and now with ISIS and so that's a, it, they used to be mostly uh, pretty much limited to the south, but now they're coming northwards. And so this time, actually, when I was there, the the U.S. State Department issued a warning for some of the areas that I was in and, and uh, an island not far from where I was preaching. Um, ISIS was in there causing trouble, so that's a problem there. In India, um, as I said, even though it's predominantly Hindu, there are a lot of Muslims there. And uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS and other radical groups have been really working hard for many, many years to try to get the Muslims in India radicalized, because that would be just a huge force in, uh, in the world if that took place. But so far, they've not been too successful. The, most of the Muslims in India seem to pretty much just want to live their lives and get along with their neighbors. And so it, the, the problem in India more so has come from Pakistan, people coming in from Muslims coming in from Pakistan. But the, the Muslims in India so far, really not that much of a problem. Um, the Hindus, however, in some areas in India uh, are, can be a big problem. In fact, we canceled one of our meetings this time because uh, we, we were told by some people living in the area that it would be unsafe at this time to go there because of uh, radical Hindu groups. And we've had other times where we, we have to take a lot of security precautions for that reason. So that's, uh, that's something a lot of people are surprised when they hear that, you know, that it's oftentimes more the Hindus in India, but that is the case. Okay, anything else? Um, so the, the question was, are children getting adopted? And we, we set up our orphanage uh, not really intending or looking for adoption because uh, we thought if we can provide the children with a safe place to live, good education, good food, teach them the word of God, uh, medical care and, and so forth, so provide for all of their needs, physical and spiritual. And then by keeping them where they are, they, they don't have to learn a different language. They don't have to adjust to any kind of different food or culture or climate or anything. It's all familiar surroundings for them. And so we're not really looking to, to have them adopted and you know, sent off to some other nation or culture where they have to go through all those adjustments. And so that's, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that we've done it that way. All right, anything else? All right, well, thank you again, and uh, let's get into the Word of God then. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's have a word of prayer as we begin.
Father, we thank you again this morning for the, the joy that it is to uh, gather together and to consider what we have in Christ, what he has done for us on the cross, and to rejoice in knowing that as we gather together this morning that we have the word of truth. And I pray as we uh, spend a few minutes now looking further into uh, this topic of the Lord's Supper, that we would continue to pay careful attention to the things that you've revealed and cast off religious tradition, not base our conclusions on emotion, but to uh, approach this topic with faith. And we thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And again, this is the, our topic this weekend has been the Lord's Supper. And uh, so the, the first night and Friday night, I'll just quickly review for those who weren't here what we talked about Friday night and last night. So Friday night, we looked at the word communion in the Bible. And we saw that in the Bible, the word communion never refers to any kind of a ceremony in church. It, the word communion in the Bible always has to do with fellowship, agreement, par, uh, having a part in something. Never anything to do with a ceremony. And we also looked at the, the term the Lord's table, and we saw that that, that also is in the Bible, but it has nothing, again, to do with any kind of a ceremony that we would have in, in church. Um, and last night, we began looking at the only passage where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and I want to begin at the beginning of that passage again and just quickly go through the verses we talked about last night. And then when we get to the, what we haven't talked about yet, I'll slow down a bit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. So notice when Paul begins this topic of the Lord's Supper, he begins it on a very negative note. That when you come together, not only is it not benefiting you, but it's actually harming you. Verse 18, for first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So another negative verse as he begins this topic, that there are divisions in the church in Corinth. Verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So there are another negative verse. There are heresies in the church in Corinth. And clearly, when you consider the context, there's heresy in, the, in this church regarding the Lord's Supper, the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. And last night we saw in the Bible, as in the English dictionary, the word heresy has to do with doctrinal error. And there is doctrinal error in the church in Corinth concerning the Lord's Supper. Verse 20, um, if, if you don't pay any attention to anything I say this morning, at least pay attention now to verse 20. Verse 20, when ye come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. I don't know how Paul could have made a more clear statement that when we come together as saints, such as we are this morning, what, what is the purpose for our coming together? Why, why have we gathered together this morning? And he clearly states in verse 20, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That is not why we gather together. So again, verse 20, when ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own, his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What, have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. In verses 21 and 22, Paul is addressing a, a conduct problem in the church in Corinth. There's clearly a, a rich and poor divide in the church. And so when they have the Lord's Supper and they're bringing food, the rich are bringing lavish, gourmet feasts, and the poor have little or nothing that they can bring. And rather than sharing with one another, 
the the rich are make sure that they get there first and they eat all their gourmet food and and they're even overeating and others go away hungry and uh, and then they're clearly having wine along with their meal with with the lord's supper and some are drinking so much that they're getting drunk so they're they're having some conduct problems and when you look at verse 22 Paul is just absolutely beside himself. He, he, he doesn't know, you know, what shall I say to you? He, he's just exasperated by what's going on here in the church in Corinth. So they have this conduct problem. But they also have a doctrinal misunderstanding about the Lord's Supper. And so in verse 23, he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now verse 23 is a very important verse to look at carefully because in most church, grace churches where they practice the Lord's Supper, this is the verse that they hang their hat on. Because I, have, I can't tell you how many times I have heard people say, that we should be practicing the Lord's Supper because Paul is our apostle, the apostle of the Gentiles, and Paul says that he received the Lord's Supper. But that's not what that verse says. Look again at verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. What did Paul receive? What did he deliver? It doesn't say, I received the Lord's Supper. He says, I received what I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So we, last night we looked in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, where Paul uses similar language, because in the church in Corinth, there is a problem with the doctrine of resurrection. Many denied that there would be a resurrection. And so to to correct their doctrinal misunderstanding about resurrection, Paul says in chapter 15 and verse 3 that he's delivering to the Corinthians what he has received of the Lord. And then when you read on and see what did he receive of the Lord, it talks about how Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ rose again from the dead. That's not new information. You can read all that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you, you can even read it prophesied in the Old Testament. That's not new information. But then he goes on, because again, remember, Paul was not there. When Christ rose from the dead, Paul was not there. He didn't see him. So he can't give a firsthand account of what, what all took place then. So God gave Paul a revelation. This is what happened back there in that past dispensation. Christ died, he was buried, he rose again from the dead. James saw him, Cephas saw him, the twelve saw him. And then he says 500 saw him at once. The only place in the Bible where you can read that when Christ rose from the dead, 500 saw him at one time, the only place you can find that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You can't read that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or the book of Acts. So God revealed to Paul what took place back there in the previous dispensation, and he gave him additional information that was not given in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or the book of Acts. So the same thing he does with the Lord's Supper here in chapter 11. Again, Paul was not there that night in which Christ was betrayed. And so God gave Paul a revelation. This is what took place that night. That night in which Jesus was betrayed, this is what he did, this is what he said. But he gives Paul additional information that is not written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or the book of Acts. Because the Corinthians had a doctrinal misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper, and they need some additional information so that they're very clear and, and they have this correct. And so that's what he's doing beginning in verse 23. Paul received that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Um, Brian mentioned to me Friday night 
uh, he, we didn't spend, we, we haven't spent a long time talking about this passage and seeing if we agree on everything and so forth, but he just made a brief comment to me Friday night uh, about this phrase in verse 23. It says, the, the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed. It's important to, when you're reading the Bible to note things like that. He could have just, he could have just re referred to that night in a number of ways. He could have said that the night when Jesus you know, had the Lord's Supper or the night when Jesus was with the 12 apostles, a number of ways he could have referred to that. But he says the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And, and that's going to help us to understand some things as we move along. Continuing in verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. When he says in verse 24, which is broken for you, who is you? This is Jesus talking to the 12 apostles. The you is the 12 apostles. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Again in verse 25, who is ye? This is Jesus speaking to the 12 apostles. He's saying, this do ye, 12 apostles, as oft as ye, 12 apostles, drink it in remembrance of me. Now, a key comes then in verse 26, because there, there are some Bibles that are, they claim that they're printing the words that Jesus spoke in red letters, in red ink. And they put verse 24 and 25 in red ink, that Jesus spoke these words to the 12. But then they put verse 26 in black ink, that this is no longer what Jesus spoke, but this is now Paul writing to the Corinthians. But the color of the ink is not given by inspiration of God. And I think they make a great flaw when they do that. In verse 26, Paul is continuing to quote what Jesus said that night to the 12. So he says, for as often as ye, well, who is you in verse 24? Who is ye in verse 25? The 12 apostles. Verse 26, we flow right into that. For as often as ye, 12 apostles, eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. When they had this supper, after Christ died, his, the, the absence of the Lord would be conspicuous. Here we have the Lord's Supper, and the Lord isn't here. And why is he not here? Because he died. He was crucified. And so they, they're showing the Lord's death till he come. And, and I mentioned last night, um, one thing that, one objection that many would have when I, when I say that verse 26 is still quoting what Jesus said that night to the 12, they would say, well then why does he say in verse 26, ye do show the Lord's death? Why doesn't he say, you do show my death? Why does he say the Lord's death? And we looked at a couple verses last night and we could look at many more. And, and I'm sure if I, once I say this, you'll think, oh yeah, I remember reading this kind of thing many times. Many times when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus refers to himself in the third person. So he'll say, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He doesn't say, I came, but he says, the Son of Man came. And many times he refers to himself in that manner. So it's not at all unusual that Jesus would be sitting there with the 12 apostles and say to them, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. All right, that's where we left off last night, so then we'll continue in verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Uh, this verse to me is a major problem for those who say that we should be observing the Lord's Supper today and that this passage is talking about us. Because he warns in verse 27, about eating the bread and drinking the cup unworthily. And he says, if you do so, you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Can, can we, as saved people, 
members of the church, a body of Christ, can we be guilty? Can we be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord? Is it not the body and blood of the Lord that is our salvation? Can we be guilty of that? Turn over to, and keep this open, we're going to be here all morning, but turn over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. You know, in Paul's epistles, he never uses the word guilt. Not one time does he use the word guilt. Here he uses the word guilty in Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. He's clearly here talking about unsaved people. That in the, the unsaved people in the world are guilty before God. He never says that members of the church body of Christ are guilty. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we, we could look at dozens of verses here, but Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We are not guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. We are holy and without blame before him in love. Okay, go back to 1 Corinthians 11. So, to, to try to apply 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 to us today is a major doctrinal blunder. So, again in verse 27, he, Jesus is, Paul is still quoting what Jesus said that night in which he was betrayed, speaking to the twelve apostles. And Jesus said to them, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Did anyone there that night eat and drink unworthily? Of course, Judas Iscariot did. And that's where Brian's comment back in verse 23 is, is a help. The same night in which he was betrayed. Well, who betrayed him? Judas Iscariot. And you're, you're all familiar with this, but turn back to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And beginning in verse 23. And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man, and notice, by the way, how he speaks about himself here in verse 24. He says, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. He doesn't say, I go as it is written of me. But the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. Okay, go back to 1 Corinthians 11. That's what verse 27 is talking about, 1 Corinthians 11, 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, that's exactly what Judas Iscariot did that night, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And was Judas guilty of the body and blood of the Lord? Absolutely. So if we try to apply verse 27 to us today, we have a major doctrinal problem of Paul saying that we, saved people, are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. How, how, can, how can that be possible? It's not possible. But if we leave it in its proper context, of Jesus speaking these words that night in which he was betrayed, it fits perfectly. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Verse 28 is a, is a key verse in many churches where they practice the Lord's Supper. Um, and, and as I mentioned last night, I, I, I grew up Roman Catholic, and I've been in many Protestant churches. 
And when they come to the point in the Mass or in their service where they have what, what they mistakenly call communion or, or the Lord's Supper, there's this solemn, religious, somber atmosphere that comes over the church. And it, it becomes a very emotional moment in the church. Prior to that, people are just acting normal. But all of a sudden now, oh, this is a very holy moment now that we have to be more reverent and so forth. And, and a part of that then, oftentimes the, the preacher, the priest, or the pastor will talk about how you know, we're going to pause for a moment and as it says in verse 28, let a man examine himself. And so we'll have a moment of silence and you can all examine yourself. And, and I used to, before I understood the, the doctrine correctly, but I had some questions, I would be sitting there and I think, okay, so the, the pastor just said that we're going to have silence now and all of you examine yourself. And I was thinking, what, what am I supposed to be thinking about? What, what, what's supposed to be going on in my mind right now? Ex how, do, how do I examine myself? And, and I used to think, am I qualified to examine myself? Yeah, I have to tell you, if I examine myself, I'm going to come out looking pretty good. And the same is true with you, if you examine yourself. So what, what, what does that mean, examine yourself? Exactly what am I supposed to be thinking here? And it, it leaves a whole lot of questions that you can't find answers to in the scripture. Let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. But if you again understand in verse 28, this is still quoting what Christ said that night to the 12. Now it fits perfectly. Uh, look at Mark chapter 14. So Jesus said, as he's sitting there that night, he says to the 12, but let a man examine himself. Notice Mark chapter 14 and verse 19. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him one by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? So what did they begin to do? They began to examine themselves. Is it I? We read a moment ago, Judas Iscariot said, is it I? So one by one, they began to examine themselves. Is it I? So in 1 Corinthians 11:28. If you try to apply that to our lives today, if I tell you this morning, you know, I'm going to just stop talking for a couple minutes and I want all of you to examine yourself. If you're a thinking person, you're going to be like, okay, what am I supposed to be thinking here? What am I supposed to be examining? And, but it, it's not this vague, general kind of thing. It's a very specific thing. One of you is going to betray me. Let a man examine himself. So they're examining themselves. Is it I? Is it I? Okay, uh, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So again in verse 29, he talks about eating and drinking unworthily. Um, and, and that in itself, by the way, if, you know, if we were going to have the Lord's Supper this morning, and, and I, I warned you now, make sure you don't eat or drink unworthily this morning when we have the Lord's Supper, how are you going to determine if you're worthy or not worthy? And th there's no set of instructions in the scriptures where you could say, okay, here, here it clearly tells me how to know if I'm worthy or not worthy to partake in this. And then in verse 29, he says, if you eat and drink unworthily, you eat and drink damnation to himself. And that again, there are, there are a number of churches that teach that if you eat or drink unworthily in what they call communion or holy communion, that you suffer damnation, which they say is eternal judgment. And then others say, no, that's not the meaning of the word damnation. It doesn't mean eternal judgment. And then, you know, they come up with something else that means, it means condemnation or something. Um, and then the end of verse 29, this really helps us now. How do you know if you're eating and drinking unworthily? 
He says, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, my question again in verse 29, if we try to apply this to our lives today, can you be saved and not discern the Lord's body? How would that be? If you don't know who the Lord is, you don't understand that God the Father prepared a body for him, and, and he came to this earth, the word was made flesh, and, and then he died on the cross for our sins. If you don't understand that, how could you be saved? And, and if you are saved, you clearly understand that. Now, you may not understand a lot more than that, but you clearly understand that much anyway. So how could you be saved and not discern the Lord's body? That, that makes no sense to me, that that, how that would be possible. But again, in verse 29, he's still quoting what Christ said that night to the twelve. Jesus said that night to the twelve, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, which Judas did, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, which Judas certainly did, not discerning the Lord's body. Judas Iscariot certainly did not discern the Lord's body. Judas never believed that Jesus was the Christ. Do you know Judas never called Jesus Lord? He never believed that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Lord. He, he did not discern the Lord's body. Uh, turn over to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And uh, in Acts chapter 1, it talks about how Judas Iscariot killed himself, and then they have to choose a replacement for him. So they have